<laughs> okay. Hello. Hello. Oh, thank you, Glenn. You guys are having such a good time. I'll just sit here and watch. I mean, you know. Yeah, that's good. How's everybody doing? Is it ever going to get above 50? My goodness. Snow on the truck. I am. What? Oh, I am so tired of this cold weather. Anyway, how's everybody doing? Cold. Everybody's cold. And wet. Got uh, rain rot on your feet. We are what? Oregonia. Yeah, got webbed feet, right? Duck feet. All right, you guys, let's open up to Second Samuel, chapter 22. We are going to be wrapping this book up here really quick. We're coming to the end of David's life here. Oh. <laughs> I was in First Samuel going, that's not what I'm looking for. It does make a difference. Ah, there we go. Okay, very good. So, hello everybody. Hello. So good to be with you tonight. So, yeah, good, uh, thank you. I'm glad you said that. I was hoping somebody would say that. Mm. All right, let's pray, huh? Let's pray and we'll get busy. Father, thank you so much, Lord your love for us and Lord that you you demonstrated that great love through your son Jesus Lord we're humbled Lord we're we're so blessed to know that we have a future with you uh, as we look around and we see so many things <laughs> that are so chaotic and so against you, it seems every day, it just piles on. But Lord, we do have hope in you. You are our hope. You are our rock, our salvation. And Lord, we know that your faithfulness towards us never ends. That your mercy is new every morning. And that your grace draws us so close to you and together with one another. We thank you for that, Lord. We thank you for the friendships that we have, the family that we have here. Lord, we just want to let you know how much we appreciate you tonight. And uh, Lord, as we open your word, as we read these great, powerful words of David tonight, Holy Spirit, we just ask that you would speak to our hearts as you remind us of just your greatness and your awesome power we thank you for that in jesus name amen, amen. all right so we're going to be in chapter 22 tonight and um, this is a a song or i guess you could say a psalm but um, my version here says it's a song does anybody else say it's a song? <coughs> okay. So there's no musical notes here for us, we, so we don't know how to play it. I guess you could make up your own tune as you're going through it, right? Maybe we'll go around and have each person sing a verse, right? I'm just kidding. Don't leave. Don't leave. I'm just kidding. So we're going to go down through here, and we're going to take a look at this uh, probably a chunk at a time. It's... Uh, you probably notice it's a really, really long. And this is actually Psalm 18. Um, it's almost word for word from Psalm 18. It's the only psalm that we find in these uh, uh, First and Second Samuel that's, uh, uh, that David wrote. And 
entering into, well, we know that at this point in David's life, he has, um, he's cleaned house pretty good. He's, he's tied up loose ends, you know, when, when you get close to knowing you're going to go to glory, you know, you, if you have time, you want to tie up loose ends, you know. Uh, David had that opportunity here, and, and of course, he dealt with Saul and, and uh, uh, Saul's family, he buried them. Uh, he cleansed the world of the uh, uh, Philistine giants, uh, took them out and finished them off. And uh, as he approaches the, towards the end of his time, he writes this. So I'm going to go ahead and start reading down through here. You're going to notice, though, as we read it, there's a lot of things in here that you're going to think, oh my gosh, did David go through that? Did he experience that? Well, we're going to find out that a lot of the stuff, no, he did not experience. But a lot of the things we're going to read are actually prophetic. They're messianic um, statements that he makes. He refers to Noah. He refers to Jesus. He refers to, um, well, we'll just kind of touch on it as we go through here. So then, the, then David, in verse 1, he spoke to the Lord the words of this song. On the day when the Lord had delivered him, from the hand of all of his enemies, and from the hand of Saul. And he said, The Lord is my rock, and my fortress, and my deliverer, the God of my strength in whom I will trust, my shield, and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold, and my refuge, my Savior. You save me from violence. I will call upon the Lord, who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from my enemies. So right away he opens up this song with intense praise to God. I think there's nine different um, attributes, I guess you would call them, in these first three or four verses that we're reading here. He's our rock, our fortress, our deliverer, our strength, our shield, the horn of our salvation, our stronghold, our refuge, our Savior. Wow. Talk about multitasking, huh? <laughs> God's a lot of things to David, isn't he? And to me, when I look at this right here, and I don't know about you guys, but I, my heart's heavy about some of the things that I'm seeing happening around us you know it just kind of gets to the point where you're just thinking oh my gosh you know um i never dreamt that it was going to get so crazy um but you know i look at these verses right here and i want to own these i want them to be my rock i want him to be my deliverer and my fortress and 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 you too you want these things you want that kind of relationship with God. And you know, you know that David wasn't perfect. David made many mistakes in his life. But now here he comes towards the end of his life. And, and this is the sum total of, of his finishing statements about God. I love it. He's a rock, meaning he's, he's firm foundation. He never changes. He's, we're not going to sink. We're going to be able to stand upon that rock. Um, there's a song that said, I was, I was sinking in the mire and you put me on a rock. You gave me a foundation to stand upon. And we need that foundation, especially in these last days that we're living in right now. We need that rock. And he's also our fortress. He's a place where we can go to be safe. He's our protector, isn't he? He's, he's made a place for us. And not only is he our fortress, but he's also our deliverer. Now, that is a big word right there, the word deliverer. It could encompass a lot of things. It can encompass delivering us from danger, which uh, David is probably thinking about as he's writing this. He delivers us from our um, 
our practicing sins. He delivers us from that. He delivers us from uh, stress and anxiety and all of the things that would tend to erode us in spirit. He is our deliverer. And he's also the God of my strength. I love that. In whom I will trust. How many times do people try to go through the process of life in their own strength? With their own resources, with their own means. I've got this. I can handle this. You know, I've got, I, I got it under control. Well, gosh, if you got it under control, that's pretty amazing because I don't have it under control. You know, I need to have his strength. I need to know that he's going to see us through. He's going to keep us strong during the times of temptation. During, you know, you look at uh, Lot in, in the story of Sodom. And it tells us in that story that Lot was vexed in his spirit because of the wickedness in Sodom. It made him sick in his spirit to see the things that were going on. I don't know. Uh, that's kind of how I feel sometimes when I see what's going on. It makes me sick inside, inside my spirit. Um, and I got to have that strength. I got to be able to trust the Lord to be able to pray that prayer and say, Lord, we have a future with you. We're not afraid. We know that you're here. We know that you have control of all things. And so I'm going to trust you because you are my strength. You're also my shield. I'm going to hold that shield up. Now, it's interesting because when we look at the um, uh, armor of God that's described in the New Testament, one of the things is the shield of faith, right? And we use that shield to... Um, knock down the fiery arrows that come from our adversary. And here David is saying much the same thing. You're my shield. And you're the horn of my salvation. That's kind of a metaphor because the horn always represented power. It represented strength. And a lot of times people would run to an altar and they would want to grab a hold of the horns of the altar because they would want to draw strength from it in a symbolic way. And David's mentioning that right here, that you are also the horn of my salvation. You're my stronghold and my refuge. Those two things come together. We take refuge in his stronghold. We take refuge in that protective place that he puts us in in time of danger and you are my savior you saved me from violence now the word savior there is a derivative of the word yeshua which is in the uh in the hebrew and translated back into english we know that yeshua was the name of jesus and it's also a derivative of the name of Jehovah. They're all interconnected with one another. So here we see almost a prophetic messianic statement being made. You are my, you're my Messiah. You're my Savior. Well, that can only be one person, right? That can only be Jesus. That, that can only be the Lord himself. And so I will call upon the Lord. Based upon all of these things that he's just said, here's the conclusion. Because of all of this, I'm going to call upon the Lord who's worthy to be praised. He's worthy to be praised and I will be saved from my enemies by my Savior who is the Lord, who is Jehovah or if you want to go further, Jesus. Now, here in verse 5, the, the whole thought process changes. This is more of a, 
more of a prophetic group of verses. Um, when the waves of death surrounded me, when the floods of ungodliness made me afraid, the sorrows of Sheol surrounded me, and the snares of death confronted me. And in my distress, I called upon the Lord, and I cried out to my God, and he heard my voice from his temple. And my cry entered his ears. Then the earth shook and trembled. The foundations of heaven quaked and were shaken because he was angry. Smoke went up from his nostrils and devouring fire from his mouth. Coals were kindled by it. He bowed the heavens also and came down with darkness under his feet. He rode upon a cherub and flew, and he was seen upon the wings of the wind. He made darkness canopies around him, dark waters and thick clouds of the skies. From the brightness before him, coals of fire were kindled. So, you look at these things right here and you think, wow, Dave, when did you go through that kind of stuff on a literal, you know, basis here? Um, yes, he had the snares of death. Yes, he had enemies. But the waves he's talking about here that surrounded him, the flood of ungodless made me, the, of, of the ungodless made me afraid. The sorrow of the grave surrounded me. You know, we know that when Jesus was crucified, he experienced these things that we're reading right here. The waves of death. He, the death that he was experiencing was a death that he had never experienced in all of eternity. Because he came and took upon himself human flesh and it was the flood of ungodliness that was pressing down on the Lord when he was on the cross, when he was dying for our sins. And we know that when he did die, we know that he went down into the innermost parts of the earth. And he preached the gospel to all those souls down there that were Old Testament believers who were waiting for him to come. The Bible tells us that he went into the, to the in, inner parts of the earth and he led captivity captive. He took all those people that were there waiting captive in that particular place and he pulled them all out of there and took them to heaven with him. Now, there's two sides to that particular place, of course, you know. Um, there's the side where Abraham was and all of those of faith dwelt on that side and then there was a giant canyon or gulf if you will and on the other side of it there were all of those wicked dead who had died so when he led captivity captive he only took one group he took the he took the ones who died in faith who were looking forward to the cross they were looking forward to the cross much like we're looking forward to his second coming, like we're looking forward to the rapture. But for our salvation, we look backwards to see our salvation and how it was purchased uh, for us by Jesus. So he took these people who had been waiting, who died in faith, never receiving the promise. But yet, and, and who was the last Old Testament prophet? Who was the guy, the last Old Testament prophet to be in that place? That was John the Baptist. You see, John the Baptist was, he's in the New Testament, but he was still under the Old Covenant up until the time that he died. He, he did not live to see the blood of Christ poured out for his sins. And so when he went, that's where he went. He went to Abraham's, they called it Abraham's bosom. A place of comfort, 
a nice place, not a bad place. And so we, we see in verse 7, In my distress I called out upon the Lord, and I cried out to my God. And we see that happening from the cross. And he heard my voice from his temple, and my cry entered his ears. And we know what happened when he took his last breath. You know, we had the, the little um, play Friday and, and Sunday about the crucifixion and the resurrection. And one of the things that uh, I thought was really cool was when they played that thunder and the shaking of the earth um, during that particular time. And we know that it became dark. We know that the earth shook. We know that things crumbled when Jesus died on the cross. And it tells us here that the earth shook and trembled. Now, how does this work? I mean, you think David knows what he's saying? Do you think David knows that he's talking about Jesus? I don't think so. I think he's just praising the Lord. I think he's just writing things down and probably doesn't even realize that he's writing down prophetic things. It happens a lot, in, 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 uh, especially in David's life. Because we don't see the earth shaking and trembling or anything like that in David's world, but it was his bloodline, it was his it was his great, 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 whatever grandson. When he died, the earth shook. The foundations of heaven quaked and were shaken. All of the sin of the world was being poured out upon Jesus. And the Lord was, the Lord God the Father was literally pouring his wrath out on Christ. He did that in your place and in my place so that we wouldn't have to experience his wrath. And this statement of smoke coming out of his nostrils and, and devouring fire from his mouth just speaks of judgment. It speaks of his power. It speaks of um, what a price was paid for you and I to be able to sit here tonight together he paid everything it's an amazing thing when you think about it he gave it all up for us and the father poured it out all on him that it just blows my mind when i think about that that we get to be the recipients of that it says that he rode upon a cherub now every time you see the the lord uh, he's uh, Jehovah, the Father, God, whatever, he's, he's, he's accompanied by these cherubs. And they're not pudgy little baby-looking angels like you see, right? These are mighty, mighty angels. They accompany him when he passes judgment or when he moves. And it's interesting to me that it says that, that he flies, on a cherub. That's just really, really cool. And he was seen on the wings of the wind. Now that's an interesting statement there because you could actually, um, you could render that to say the, um, the wings of the Spirit. Because wind, well, Jesus talked about that in the New Testament. He said, the Spirit of God is like the wind. You don't know where it's coming from. You really don't know where it's going. But you can tell it's been there because it moves things. You can feel it moving. You can feel, and it's, it's a word for spirit. It's the, it's the word pneuma. It's the word that we get pneumatic from. So when you go to have your tires removed, and zing, zing, they're using that machine, that that's air-powered, it's pneumatic. That's what this word is, literally. One of the, um, if not, the very first reference to the Spirit of God. 
The only other reference you find is in Genesis when it says the Spirit of God moved upon the water. And it tells us that there was dark canopies around him and dark water and thick clouds of the sky. From the brightness before him, coals of fire were kindled. And the Lord thundered from heaven, and the Most High uttered his voice. He sent out arrows, and he scattered them, and lightning bolts, and vanquished them. And then the channels of the sea were seen. The fountains of the world were uncovered at the rebuke of the Lord, at the blast of his breath of his nostrils. Now, what is this? This is interesting. We're talking about the oceans, the water coming up. We're talking about a flood. We're talking about judgment. And we're talking about just a very few people that survived the flood in reference to Noah. The channels of the sea. Now that's really interesting. You got, got to look at how far back into what we would almost consider primitive world when this was written. There were seafaring people and they were quite educated when it came to the surface of the sea. They knew how to use the wind. They knew how to use the currents. They, they knew how to navigate. But they had no idea what was under the water. They had no ideas that more than a mile down that there were great canyons and channels. We're just now learning about these things. We know more about the surface of the moon than we do the ocean. Isn't that amazing? Another word for the ocean we like to use is the sea. A seafaring person. But really the word for sea is the word abyss. And you find that there are those who are in the abyss right now waiting judgment. They're, they're prisoners there. They're fallen angels that are awaiting the judgment of God on that great day. And they're held captive there. Now when you read in Revelation, it's quite interesting because it tells us towards the end there that there won't be any more sea. The sea will be gone. Because there won't be any need for the abyss anymore. There won't be need for that prison, if you will. Because those angels, those fallen angels, will have been judged. And now here, David, through the Holy Spirit, of course, is making reference to these channels in the sea. And the foundations of the world were uncovered. That's pretty amazing right there. The foundations of the world, those deep, deep places. And the foundations being uncovered at how? At the rebuke of the Lord, at the blast of the breath of his nostrils. And he sent from above, and he took me, and he drew me out of many waters, and delivered me from my strong enemy, from those who hated me. For they were too strong for me. They confronted me in the day of my calamity, but the Lord was my support. He also brought me out into a broad place, and he delivered me because he delighted in me. I wonder if this is a reference to Noah. I wonder if this, this whole thing that we're reading right here about the foundation and the waters and the floods and the channels and all of that, referring, who did he draw? out of many waters. It wasn't David. It wasn't Jesus. But Noah and his family were drawn out of many waters, out of a flood, out of a judgment from God. And as we mentioned earlier, um, we know exactly what the world was like back then. 
we know that wickedness abounded in the world back then. It was like Sodom and Gomorrah everywhere. Isn't that interesting that we look around us today and it's, it's like that, isn't it? It's like Sodom and Gomorrah everywhere. And believe me, God sees it. But he delivered me because he delighted in me. He brought me into a broad place. He gave me a new start. He, he, he rescued me. Verse 21, the Lord rewarded me according to my righteousness. According to the cleanness of my hands, he has recompensed me. For I have kept the ways of the Lord and have not wickedly departed from my God. Now, he's either making reference to someone else or he's fibbing because he did depart, didn't he? He did do things that were, could qualify as being wicked. He was a murderer, an adulterer, a liar, a conspirator. And if the Lord were to reward him according to his righteousness, he didn't have much. According to the cleanness of his hands. They weren't very clean. Why didn't he get to build the temple? God said, you're a bloody man, David. I'm not going to let you build my house. I'll let your son build it, but you're not going to build it. Verse 23, all of his judgments were before me. And as for his statutes, I did not depart from them. I was also blameless before him, and I kept myself from my iniquity. Therefore, the Lord has recompensed me according to my righteousness, according to my cleanness in his eyes. You got to wonder if he's making, a, if the Holy Spirit's making a refuge he, uh, reference here to the Lord. The Lord is the one that was pure. The Lord is the one that was blameless before the Father. The Lord is the one that was righteous and kept himself from all iniquity. And then he goes down here in verse 26. It's kind of an interesting thing here. You know, it's kind of a, I don't know, you guys know what karma, you used to believe in karma, maybe during the early days, you know, you got to have good karma, you know. Well, this is kind of that thing, you know. You get what you put out there, right? With the merciful, you'll show mercy. With the blameless, you'll show yourself blameless. With the pure, you'll show yourself pure. And with the devious, you will show yourself shrewd. You will save the humble people, but your eyes are on the haughty that you may bring them down. For you are my lamp, O Lord. The Lord shall enlighten my darkness. Boy, we know about that. We know that Jesus said, I am the light of the world. And then he turns around and points at you and me and he says, you are the light of the world. You're a reflection of God's light to the world. For by you, I can run against a troop. By my God, I can leap over a wall. As for God, His way is perfect. The word of the Lord is proven. He is a shield to all who trust in Him. I like that phrase, that the word of the Lord is proven. Have you ever have somebody come up to you and you make a statement to them and they'll say, prove it. You might go up to somebody and say, I love you, and they'll say, prove it. Well, we don't have to worry about the Lord because His way is perfect, and His word has been proven. You can count on it. You can trust in it. 
And again, we have this reference to a shield. He is a shield to all who trust in Him. For who is God except the Lord? And who is a rock except our God? God is my strength and power. He makes my way perfect. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He sets me on my high places. He teaches my hands to make war so that my arms can bend a bow of bronze. Now, bows aren't made out of bronze, right? They're made out of wood. So this is kind of an exceptional statement here when he says, I have this bow of bronze and I can bend, God makes it so that I can even bend the bow of bronze. I have a great strength. You have also given me the shield of your salvation. Your gentleness, I love that, has made me great. You enlarged my path under me so my feet did not slip. I love that. That's such a beautiful picture of, you ever been like before the Lord praying and you just can't really find the words to express to him what you're feeling? I have that happen to me a lot. And sometimes I just feel like I'm saying things that I've said a million times. I want to say more. I want to go deeper. I want to express myself in a, in a deeper way of how I feel. And when I read these Psalms, David, the Holy Spirit, I should say, is able to allow David to express his feelings towards God in a really deep and intimate way. So there's a lot of times when I'm reading something like this and I think, I want to make this my prayer. I want to make it my way of expressing my love to the Lord. Can I use these words? Can I plagiarize these words and use them and own them myself before God? Absolutely. It's a blessing to be able to do that. Verse 38, I have pursued my enemies and destroyed them. Neither did I turn back again until they were destroyed. I have destroyed them and wounded them so that they could not rise. They have fallen under my feet. For you have armed me with strength for the battle. You have subdued under me those who rose against me. You have also given me the necks of my enemies, so that I destroyed those who hated me. And they looked, but there was none to save, even to the Lord. But he did not answer them. And then I beat them as fine as the dust of the earth. I trod them like dirt in the streets and spread them out. Wow, that's pretty intense. That's kind of, a, uh, that's kind of final, don't you think? <laughs> no coming back from being ground to dust. There's no, no coming back from that. He goes on in verse 44. You've delivered me from the strivings of my people. We know that that applies right to David. You've kept me as the head of the nations. A people I have not known shall serve me. The foreigners submit to me. As soon as they hear, they obey me. The foreigners fade away and come frightened from their hideouts. The Lord lives. Blessed be my rock. Now, let me just suggest this. <clears throat> when we pray, uh, Jesus taught us how to pray. With the, well, it's called the Lord's Prayer. I like to think of it as the disciples' prayer. It's our prayer, not the Lord's Prayer. But he gave that prayer to us and... Sometimes people think that if they memorize it and say it the way Jesus said it, 
that that's what is supposed to happen. But what if it's more of an outline for prayer? What if it's more like a skeleton for prayer and we can add meat to it? But the interesting thing about the disciples' prayer is it starts with praise and it ends with praise. In between the praise of the start and the end are the requests, everything that's included in their daily provision, all that kind of stuff. Victory over the enemy, whatever it might be. Over temptation, uh, daily provision, all that stuff. Well, David's been kind of a little bit long-winded here in this prayer, this song, if you will. But he started this whole thing with huge praise. Talking about who God is, the shield, the buckler, the refuge, the fortress, the Savior, all of those things that God is, and he's praising him. Who is like unto you, O Lord? There's none like unto you, O Lord. And now as he, as he begins to wrap this song up, psalm, prayer, however you want to put it, we find him once again entering into really deep praise for God. The Lord lives. Blessed be my rock. Let God be exalted. The rock of my salvation. It's God who avenges me and subdues the people under me. He delivers me from my enemies. You also lift me up above those who rise against me. You have delivered me from the violent man. Therefore, I will give thanks to you, O Lord, among the Gentiles. And I will sing praises to your name. He is the tower of salvation to his king. And shows mercy to his anointed, to David and his descendants forevermore. So very powerful words there as he um, comes to the end of this great song. That, that, you know, I don't know if you've ever written poems or wrote a song or anything like that. But, you know, a lot of times... When, when a person writes like that, you think, you know, there are times like I've written songs before and I've really wrestled with the words and to, do you make it rhyme and what's the chorus going to be and how's this thing going to be laid out and, and you stress and you work at it and you're sweating over it and you know what, the best ones come when they just flow out of you. They just flow out of you. You talk to some of the, uh, the great musicians today, the, the great uh, writers today, and they'll tell you, my greatest works, I wrote it down in five minutes. I wrote it down on the way to work one morning, you know, and it becomes a classic, you know. Um, so you got to wonder, did this just flow out of David as he began to, to write it down? I, I think so. I think he was just being really sensitive to God. And as he was writing, he, he moves into so many different areas of, in his relationship to God. Prophetic areas. Things that were going on during his life. The, the great forgiveness of, of, of the Lord to those who trust in him. And one of the things that I look back in, like in verse 29, I think is very significant. It says, you are my lamp and you will enlighten my darkness. He's the one that pulls us out of darkness. He's the one that shows us his light. It illuminates us. It allows us to see. And boy, I tell you, when you see yourself in God's light, there's not much pride left there. There's not much me-ism <laughs> left. You know, it's all about, then you understand why David said, man, I'm nothing but a worm. I'm just a, a worm. How could God love me? You know, how could he have such a great plan for my life? But he does, doesn't he? 
he enlightens us. And he gives us hope that nothing else is able to provide in our lives. I think it's awesome. And so next week, we will finish up this book. And um, it's, uh, we're going to try to finish it up. <laughs> I'll put it that way. Uh, and then we'll be moving on into a new, brand new study. So anyway, let's go ahead and pray. Lord, we want to thank you tonight. Lord, for your word. Wow, it's so awesome. It's awesome to know, Lord, that you know the end from the beginning. It's awesome to know, Lord, that nothing takes you by surprise, that everything is ordained by you, that nothing happens that you don't allow it to happen. That includes our lives, our, our families, our communities, our country, our planet, that you are in complete and total control. You are sovereign, Lord. And, and we submit to that tonight as we bow before you, as we acknowledge you as our light and our salvation. And Lord, I just pray that you would help us as we go out of here tonight to let our light shine. Lord, that we would not be dimmed by the darkness that's out there, but Lord, that we would shine bright that you would allow us to share your light with others who are so lost. And Lord, you know there are so many that are they're just wandering in the darkness. But there are those out there in darkness, God, that you have called. You've called them by name. And I pray that, Lord, we would be the ones that might be able to go out and share with them as we encounter them in our lives that your Holy Spirit would speak to them, that it would guide us and give us wisdom so that we can represent you out there in the world, Lord. We know the time is short, and we thank you, Lord, for your word. In Jesus' name, amen.